Hi there and welcome along to the second edition of The Front Page, the brand new Racing Post programme that is all about bringing you opinion and analysis on the hottest racing stories. If you are a returning customer, thank you for coming back. If you're a newbie, fret not, there's a format, but it's so easy to follow. Joining me, Lee Mottishead, around this fine wood table once again are my colleagues Chris Cook and Maddie Playle, and there is plenty for us to discuss. For a start, it's Royal Ascot week, and gracing Royal Ascot this week are two of the three highest rated racehorses anywhere in the world. One of them is trained in Australia, and that could be reflective of this particular Royal Ascot. It could be a great week for the internationals. Will they be the story of the week? And also, how long, given British prize money, can we expect them to keep coming back? We all obviously hope the participants taking part on the track at Ascot will come back safe and sound, but are jockeys increasingly risking the safety of their colleagues by riding dangerously? Huey Morrison certainly thinks so. And finally, although the action at Ascot will be fabulous and full of runners, that has not been the case elsewhere in Britain this year. We'll be looking at falling field sizes and a right old British racing politics rumpus. So what is that format I mentioned earlier on? Dead easy, the three of us will each pitch a story that we believe should go down as the overall front page story of the week. And at the end of the programme, someone, me, will decide what that story should be. And this week, I'm gonna go first. And I'm gonna go first with this story, two prong story of field sizes in British racing and that rumpus in racing politics. So. Tuesday, Wednesday, last week, we ran a two special reports in the Racing Post. One looking at why field sizes have fallen in Britain this year, and they have fallen. If you look at 2022, the first five months of the year, the field size average is the smallest it's ever been on record, and that goes back to 1995. Um, we spoke to people who tried to explain why that might be. Obviously the weather is a reason, we haven't had the abandonments we'd have in the normal year, but there are more uh, ongoing long-term trends. There aren't necessarily enough horses to service the number of races that we're staging. We have got an excess of horses going to different territories. Uh, we have got um, competition between uh, race course groups that might be having an impact. Um, we've got other factors as well, things like uh, horses being monopolized, the top horses being monopolized in a smaller number of yards. So loads of reasons for it. In part two, we looked at what might be done to, to tackle it. And there are things you, you, you can do. Um, but I think at the heart of it was that there was a sense of urgency within the BHA. In fact, we quoted in the piece um, BHA Chief Operating Officer Richard Wyman, who said, and I'm reading this from my piece now, the warning lights on the dashboard are already flashing and I'm concerned failure to act will mean the situation worsens. So it seemed going into... Uh, last week's meeting of the BHA Executive Committee that something would be done. Three votes in that one, one for the RCA, one for the Thoroughbred Group, one for the BHA. The RCA, as expected, voted against a BHA plan to axe between 250 and 300 races from next year's fixture list. That was sort of expected, even though the Jockey Club and some large indies are pro the policy, ARC was against it. The Thoroughbred Group voted for the plan, even though some in the thoroughbred group, the RYA are against it, but the majority, NTF, uh, PGA, National Association of Racing Staff, were, were for it. Um, so in effect, Julie Harrington, BHA Chief Exec, had the deciding vote. And to many people's surprise, including, I fancy, many people who work for the BHA, she voted against taking it forward to the BHA board to decide. That has caused the sort of discord that Julie was saying she was trying to avoid. I would argue that although I don't doubt for a second that she was doing it with the best intentions and she believed that the better policy was to look at this longer term BHA strategy that was set to get later in the year and follow what, what is inside of that, it seems to me that we have a situation here, and I've referenced this in my column now, in, in, in today's column, that there's a problem now, it needs to be tackled now. If I've got a migraine now, there might be underlying reasons why I've got a migraine, but I need to take pills and get into a dark room to sort out the migraine. And it seems to me reflective of a situation whereby in racing, if there's a problem, we're all too often keen to kick it into the long grass and mm -hmm. to delay as opposed to, 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 to do. And this seemed to me to be a situation where we need to be doing things now. And also at the very heart of this, there's this astonishing situation of the BHA chief exec 
torpedoing a policy that had just been advanced by the BHA executive. That, to me, seems weird as hell. That, that was very weird. But it did derive from a time when it seemed like their scope for action was limited and that plan to sort of kill off 300 was just about the length and breadth of what they could do at that point. It's dropped it's, in the ocean though, really, isn't it? I mean, it wouldn't be enough by itself. Are we now in a situation where perhaps more might be possible now that there seems to be uh, the agreement we spoke about last week as to racing governance? Um, the, the constituent members of the sport are sort of more willing to sort of speak to the BHA and allow the BHA to guide them as to strategy. Maybe there's something to be said for just taking a pull on that um, and getting to a stage maybe even only six months further down the line when everybody's in a better position to sort of agree what action should be taken and maybe that action could be more significant than just 300 races which you know as Maddie says it's kind of a drop in the bucket is it do you get any sense that well I mean okay so uh, the, the warning lights are definitely flashing we don't want action deferred forever if this is just typical horse racing failing to agree as it always has done then that's really bad news but but maybe it could be leading us towards something better maybe it could be and I I admire the generosity of your analysis of this <laughs> of this current situation. It's, it's atypical. I, it, it, I won't be like this next week. But it's impressive. No, I, I, and, I, and I do get what you're saying. My, my, my worry would be that on this one, yes, we, we, of course we need a long-term strategy. And to be honest, it was amazing when on the day that Joe Sormer Smith was anointed as mm. BHA chair that it was revealed that there will be a strategy my god racing having a strategy i mean it should be as simple as as i said before rafa and adelson right. have got a racket it should be <laughs> obvious but it hasn't been up to now but within that that strategy announcement it was revealed as you as you say that the bha would lead mm. would lead in terms of strategy and yet on the same day as i say in the column joe sulmer smith was quoted speaking to nick luck saying that probably should be down for the race courses and the participants to, to, to yeah. determine how they want the sport to look That's in 10 staggering years. staggering though, isn't it? Well, it is, and that makes me worry that if we are in a situation whereby the BHA has been empowered, hopefully, to lead on this, that there might be a reluctance by the BHA to lead, and they might actually want to look at what the, the race courses and the participants think, and on too many issues, the race courses and the participants either won't agree or they will be minded by what is in their own best interests. Mm. And you can see why, because for them, this is an industry, but for most people, it's a sport. And I'm adamant that if you don't govern it as a sport first and foremost, then the sport as an industry right. will Withers. also suffer. Yeah. It's enough to give you a mind, right? Like you said, yeah. isn't it, really? Um, from my point of view and for, for people who might not necessarily know as much about it, what is the way forward for the sport? Because as Chris has touched on and you've touched on, we're, we're having this strategy, which is a step in the right direction. But how much trust are you putting in the BHA to deliver this strategy with the collaboration of all the different stakeholders? How is this now going to translate for the next six, 12 months? What are we expecting to see? Well, I suppose we're expecting, on this issue in particular, six months down the line, there to have been some announcement that says, we've looked at all the data that's available to us and we believe this is the right course of action to tackle this field size crisis. But against that, I know that the, the, the BHA's racing team that, that organises race programmes and fixture planning already uses tonnes of data. It's not the back of a fag packet type um, process that, that, that these decisions are reached. And again, I, I say my, my concern is that if the sport has said, if the industry has said the BHA should be leading on this, if the chief executive's first, if you like, uh, decision with this power behind her is to seek to avoid discord within the, the, within the sport with a decision that only actually produces discord anyway, then that's not the BHA leading, it's the BHA showing too much timidity. Yeah, I mean, I understand that frustration. I mean, it, what Joe said last week sort of echoed something that Julie said last year about, you know, I want to find out, you know, what the sport thinks. And I find that very frustrating at the time because, you know, everyone was looking to her as the, the, the new leader. But maybe this is a time for emollience. Um, and maybe this is a time for, you know, making all those constituent parts of horse racing feel that they're being loved and, and taken into account. And then you get them in a room right, and I hopefully think that. hammer out a strategy. You're um, far more patient man than I, Chris. Well, I mean, it has to lead somewhere. 
somewhere, you know, like a year from now, if we're still in the same place, then it's time to sort of throw your hands up in horror. But, but maybe this is not a bad time to be trying to get everybody to sort of calm down and, and talk to each other. Maddie, you, you're, you're the, the, uh, the three, well, actually, you, you both tip horses in, in, your, in, your, in your respective platforms. As people who tip horses and who bet on racing, have you been in any way put off by the way field scientists have dropped this year? Is it uh. for you um, something that makes you think, I'm a bit less interested in that car today, in trying to find winners on, on that car today? Absolutely. Um, we were speaking just before we went on air about how uh, brilliant the Tuesday of Royal Ascot looks. That's at the very top level. Yeah. Um, the prize money's there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It shouldn't be a surprise that there are big competitive fields. I, I tweeted yesterday about how I'm looking forward to having a bet, but if I'm honest, I haven't felt like that very often in a long time. It does turn me off, um, and I think if you, you were to run a poll on, on to any racing fans, to any punters, um, if it's uh, lessening their enjoyment of the sport, then of course it would be. For me, the thing I find interesting is when we're analysing which races we need to get rid of, how that data comes about, you know, whether it's looking at the income generated from the levy or um, a million different reasons about why races should or shouldn't be scrapped. It doesn't seem to me like it's necessarily straightforward. Um, and I'd like to see a bit more of that data. I'd like that to be widely available and I'd like to gain a, a greater understanding of it. But I think anyone who is a fan of racing can understand that we're going in the wrong direction here. And we need to be proactive um, in addressing this problem. And we haven't seen that so far. I, that hasn't quite been my experience. You know, I still find races tremendously fascinating. And you know, I suppose in theory, your chances of picking a winner or tipping a winner are improved if the field sizes are oh, small. Come on, Chris. I, 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 I don't know if that actually works out in practice. But um, I, I recognise that I'm not typical. I mean, there, you know, lots of bad things could happen to the sport and I would still be gripped by it, but that's not true for everybody. It's a that real, it's a real problem. That doesn't mean we should try and address no, it. No, 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 we should definitely try and address it. But one thing that slightly frustrates me is that the answer always seems to be to cut back on the number of races. You know, so we've got reducing fuel sizes, let's cut the number of races. Why can't the answer be more horses? I mean, we've never, it seems to me that there's never been a sort of concerted effort from the centre to make sure we've got an adequate supply of the raw material but on which the sport the depends. But then you need the owners to own those horses and they just aren't around well, in this current climate. Well, Even more importantly, they? surely, you need the people to look after the horses. Exactly. And we have a massive staffing crisis yeah. at the moment, in particularly in, in those yeah. big training centres. Why should we be bringing more horses into an industry where we can't look after them and already? And we need to focus on aftercare as well and what happens to horses when yes. their careers end. So that just... Put just, more fuel on the fire of that, that argument as well. I worry that, you know, when you start cutting back on races and you start cutting back on the sports sort of presence in the marketplace, to use business speak, um, you, you're risking trapping yourself in a sort of cycle of dwindling income, which isn't going to do anybody any good. You know, that's going to lead to fewer trainers, fewer businesses, fewer staff. Um, you know, it might be a, quite a vicious cycle that we get locked into once we start cutting back on the number of races, particularly if we lose races that were actually mm. levy positive, as it were, you know. I get that, and maybe just to we finish off this this section by me getting on a sermon again and just saying I, that that point there about cutting back on races that are levy generative. Surely all races, all races that take place, generate levy. There aren't really races that that are profitable, and I have real um, real trouble with the argument that's been put forward by some uh, sectors that say, what's the point of getting rid of races that actually make money for the sport? I would say. That is an argument that only looks in the short term. And in the mm. long term, if you're staging a program that is actually putting people off the sport because they think this is not as interesting as it used to be, then you might be making money today with those races, but you are potentially cutting off your income and your livelihood and you know participation in the sport in the future. So I think long term is definitely better than short term on this one. Right, that is my soapbox moment now completed. It is time, Chris Cook, sir, for the floor to be yours. What's your story? Well, my story is about safety, Lee. Safety first, people mm -hmm. always say. Nothing more important in racing and a dangerous sport than the safety of our participants, equine and human. Um, I sat in a very interesting appeal hearing last week um, at which Huey Morrison and Ed Walker, a couple of very respected flat trainers, um, put forward the argument that a rival jockey 
um, had ridden dangerously uh, in the act of beating them in the Bronte Cup at York last month. Um, significance of that, of course, is if a jockey yeah. is found to have ridden dangerously, automatic disqualification. There's no debate, there's no choice. If he's ridden dangerously, the horse gets disqualified. Yeah. So in this instance, it was a horse called Believe in Love that won, um, but in doing so, he interfered with, um, as I say, Huey's horse and Ed Walker's horse. I think Huey's was second, Ed Walker's horse third. Um, he's gone halfway across the Knaves Mire um, in the closing stages uh, on Believe in Love, um, carrying Ed Walker's horse, um, who passed right in front of the nose of Hugh Morrison's horse. Um, PJ McDonald, who was on Hugh's horse, sort of um, reacted really quickly, took his horse out of the situation. Horse also responded well. Um, so nothing bad happened. Yeah. But it's sort of thanks to the sort of immediate quick thinking um, and jockey skills uh, of PJ McDonald that nothing bad happened. Anyway, so those two trainers were making the case. Um, you know, this is more than careless riding, which was found on the day. This is actually dangerous riding, um, and the steward should have said so. Um, in the end, that wasn't accepted. Um, the, the appeals panel was happy to leave it uh, as careless riding, for which, in, in fairness, you know, Ray Dawson just served a significant sentence. He got an eight-day yeah. suspension. You know, who wants to miss a whole week's work? Sure. Um, but the point is, to me that's interesting is that trainers evidently do believe there is dangerous riding going on on our tracks. Um, and this isn't an isolated incident. John Barry pursued a similar appeal at the end of last year. Um, Harry Fry has spoken to me twice in the last few months um, about instant instances which were fairly scary involving you know, his, two of his horses were victims, uh, where he believes that they were victims of actual dangerous riding that should have been found on the day by the stewards. But in fact, there has been no finding of danger since 2009. Um, when Tony Colhane was found in breach of that rule. And the feeling is very much that stewards have got themselves into a place where they, they just don't want to find somebody to have ridden dangerously. That, you know, there's a significant stigma attached to applying that label to what any jockey does. Um, and they're very cheery about doing it. Um, if a person goes missing for seven years, you can get them declared legally dead. This rule has gone missing for 13 years. It just yeah. hasn't been applied. And I, I think it's time for us to say that, you know, basically this rule has effectively died on us. Nobody's using the dangerous riding rule in British horse racing. Um, and the consequence evidently is that, you know, the trainers out there who feel the interference rules are not being applied with sufficient vigour that you're seeing horses used, you know, not just to try and win races, but as blockers to prevent other people catching up on them in the late stages of a race, um, which is tremendously risky and completely inappropriate. I'm afraid we're gonna see some of that behavior at Royal Ascot this week. I mean, you've got those big fields, highly competitive stuff. Um, you know, every jockey determined to do everything they possibly can to win. And we've allowed a culture to arise where it's seen as being, I mean, not just okay to get in the way of somebody who might be challenging you late, but it's, it's more or less required, you know, because it's okay, it's something you have to do as a jockey. I think we'd be putting everybody in a better position if we made it clear um, to jockeys and trainers and owners that that is not an acceptable way to ride. Um, and, you know, they, they absolutely mustn't do it. I think most jockeys would actually be grateful if that were spelled out because they would mm -hmm. be safer mm -hmm. and they wouldn't be getting pressure from their connections to, to ride in that particularly aggressive manner. So you sat through um, that hearing, that BHA hearing, having watched that video, I imagine, zillions of times sure. from lots of different angles, and having heard what was said in the room, did you come to the conclusion that that was dangerous riding? Um, that was a, it was a difficult case to argue because, you know, there was, there was some evidence that the horse was, was wayward um, and Ray Dawson was sort of doing his best to control it. You not hadn't been wayward before. In fairness, it should be said the horse had never hung before. Mm. Um, it's it's so very difficult to prove, uh, isn't it? You know, if if the do jockey's doing something active which Ray denied and it was not proved, um, or if in fact he's he's trying desperately hard to get control of a wayward horse. Uh, yeah, I think in those circumstances, since you'll never be able to prove what the intent was, you just have to punish it on the basis yeah. of the effect that it's had. Uh, again, another interesting thing about the dangerous riding rule is that it basically demands, you know, a really bad outcome. I, I have part of the definition here. It says, mm. um, for dangerous riding, the rider must cause serious interference, which is when interference causes a horse and a rider to fall or very nearly fall, or the horse is severely hampered, e.g. up against the running rail, or is pushed or nearly pushed off the course. You know, there's got to be scope for saying, well, that's dangerous riding, even though there wasn't a bad outcome. Um, and if you sort of decline to sort of 
to act um, when the, you know because things have worked out okay, then I think you're sort of leaving jockeys in a space where they're taking chances Absolutely. that we we don't want them to take. Absolutely, and it begs the question: what has to happen for well. this rule or its em implementation? Um, to to come into effect. I asked you earlier, is it a case of changing the word dangerous? You said stewards are, are not likely uh, to you know be incentivized to use that word because no, I, it, conveys, I think you're scared it conveys of it. a very strong sort of um, intent. Yeah. If we change that word to unacceptable, do you think is it is it that simple? Uh, it, it could be. Yeah. I, mean, I think I would favor just abandoning labels altogether and you just have a range of penalties you know um, once you you've breached the rules and interference um, it's just a case of deciding how bad it was um, and then the stewards can take into account you know how bad they thought your writing was and how bad they thought the effect on other people was but but the the effect on other people wouldn't have to be the whole determining factor um, and once you empower stewards to sort of do that I think you you do make their lives easier you, you make it easier for them to uh, punish appropriately. How serious do you think the problem is now? Again, do you well, s do you when you watch you watch tons of racing? Do you sense that that jockeys are too often doing things that jockeys just shouldn't do? Yeah, I do. I mean, this is something I've been hammering on about for a couple yeah. of years, and I'm by no means the only one in the racing media. Nope. There's, there's a few of us. Um, and and once you sort of start looking for it, you see more and more cases, yeah. don't you? Um, I. I I really particularly don't like that thing where you're in front but your horse is getting tired so you steer in front of where you think your challenger is coming from. Yeah. Um, and you know, lots of jockeys deny that they ever do that and yet you know, yeah. um, somehow their horse happens to hang that way. Um, go figure. I, I think it, it, that's a culture that we've really got to sort of do something about. Um, if you, and of course there's the Freddie Tillitsky case, the poor guy, you know, he, he was... Sure. Um, paralysed by the, the dreadful incident at Kempton, which on the day the stewards found, you know, that Graham Gibbons had done nothing wrong. They, they didn't find him in breach of any rule. Um, but then when it gets to court, you know, he's found liable for causing that accident. Um, I, you know, I think there is a sense that the stewards historically uh, have fought shy of pointing mm. the finger when there's a really bad outcome. Um, and I think we, as well... But we, we need them for everyone's safety to apply these rules vigorously. Historically as well, what was considered race riding is probably changing. Do you think that's fair to say? Well, and yeah. things that were once deemed acceptable are maybe now not so much? That's definitely true. Because I mean, yeah, I'm sure I can remember instances in the 80s of people sort of very aggressively, more or less, trying to put people through the wing. Have our um, rules not changed enough to compensate for those changes? <laughs> But I, I think there's also, uh, there's a higher level of skill, isn't there, generally among jockeys, you know, and you could say that they're, um, they're able to sort of, to do things um, with their horses, move them about, um, without making it clear that that's what they're doing. Um, and, and, there's, and that brings with it a sort of higher level of aggression, it seems to me. Um, it, whatever the case, you know, there's, there's something to worry about there. I, I would like all of our horses to keep straight in the closing stage as hard as that may be. Um, and for that to happen, you know, you, you, we've really got to sort of get the industry's attention, make it clear that this is not acceptable anymore. And I'll tell you another thing, it, it's occurred to me, I, I'm not really in favour of just punishing jockeys more and more. I mean, we always throw that out as a solution and I don't think it gets us any place good. If you extend the interference penalties to include trainers and owners, then you'll find those employers of jockeys telling jockeys, for God's sake, you mustn't breach the interference rules, which I'm not necessarily sure in every case they're doing at the moment. No, I can see that. Um, maybe just, just, just add one little thing here. I did a column two years ago on this subject, because like, like you, it really interests me. Um, and I spoke to Marcus Whedon, who had been a BHA stipe uh, for five years and then had gone and worked in different jurisdictions. He made two main points. One was that because, as you say, there hasn't been anything since 2009, there is no precedent. So stewards can't easily say, well, right. five years ago, mm. this, this jockey did this, that was dangerous, and therefore this can be judged against that. Because there's no precedent, it makes it difficult. And the second thing was that Marcus made the point that uh, in different jurisdictions, they tend to have a, a higher entry point for riding offences. And linked to that, he said, and I'm going to quote him directly here, 
Jockeys in other countries will come to the stewards and say, he has done that to me, what are you going to do about it? They approve of the hard line. The main concern is the hard line is applied equally. In Britain, it's much more likely that in the stewards room, jockeys will do each other a favour and talk down the significance of any interference. We that, saw that at Aintree, didn't we, with, with uh, Pied Piper and Knights We did, salute. and it brings to mind Pat Cosgrave's evidence during the, the gibbons Talitsky sure. trial about saying jockeys don't really want to cause trouble. We know that jockeys want the race courses to be safer places, but if Marcus Whedon is right as well, that maybe needs to be extended into the stewards room. We're all in agreement here, I think, aren't we, that we need to see some sort of change. Uh, I definitely think so. But I mean, the, uh, another issue, of course, is that the BHA has got a massive bulging in tray. And, and so, you know, this is just, I'm not even sure it's anywhere on their list of priorities at the moment. Um, post the sort of Talitsky case, it really ought to have been something that was that was picked up. But, you know, they have their, their governance and strategy issues to worry about, gambling review, there's a whip review in progress, there's a lot going on. Um, so I sense that this is one issue that is just for pure pragmatism, it's going to be kicked down the road. But we're going to see more and more examples that make you think actions required here. Two stories down, one to go, and our final candidate to be the front page of the week looks ahead towards the greatest flat racing week of the week. Does it not, Maddie Playl? It does, and you're going to have to indulge me, I'm afraid. Go on. Uh, and my slightly nerdy love um, for international racing. This week's going to be a great showcase of it. We've got one of the the best horses in the world, Nature Strip, turning up. I yep. spoke to James McDonald uh, in the week, who was fantastically enthusiastic and passionate about coming over. And it links to your story, I guess, Lee, in that although we're having trouble with prize money, small field sizes, a whole catalogue of issues in British racing, isn't it great that we're still getting these horses, the calibre of horses and jockeys? James McDonald is officially the the best rider in the world according to the TRC rankings um, and Nature Strip third best um, but for how long? So I'm being positive mm -hmm. but there's a cautionary tale here as well. Um, before we came in I did a run through all the cards for Royal Ascot um, all days and three of the races on the Racing Post website um, for Saturday and there are 29 international raiders. We've got 10 from America, 12 from France, 3 from Australia, 1 from the Czech Republic who were uh, Chris is speaking to his jockey very soon, yeah. so I'm going to be interested to hear about Pontos in the King Stand. Two from Japan and one from Germany, so I'm hoping as many of those stand their ground as possible. Um, and essentially, I, I, I just think it's fantastic um, embellishment of our sport that we have such great diversity and all these different horses with all the different stories that we can tell uh, coming together for this one week. Um, I don't think a Royal Ascot has been illuminated in the same way uh, for some time. Nature Strip in particular. Um, let me just remind myself of what James Donald uh, said to me. He said, Nature Strip is the best sprinter I've ridden and one of the best sprinters Australia has ever seen. He's a nine-time Group 1 winner. He's won every big race here in Australia from Lightnings to TJs, three of them to Everest. He's done the whole lot. He's a seven-year-old rising eight in career best form. He seems to be getting better. Um, right. And yes, very, very strong. So if you're not aware of, of these international campaigners, in the same article he went to talk about Home Affairs, who's going to run in the Platinum Jubilee for the Cornwall Partners. Lee, I know you spoke to Chris Waller um, brilliantly um, in Sunday's Big Read, and I think that enthusiasm, and the Aussies, are, it's, a, it's a sort of train of thought that we like to, to have a dig at each other, don't we? We had it when Black Caviar came over, we had it famously when Winx came over with this sort of jibing and, and competition, and I just think it really adds something. But I do think the Aussies in particular do a great job at selling their sport, um, at really portraying that enthusiasm. Maybe it's because they're... They're not so afraid to upset each other. I'm, I'm not so sure. But essentially, um, my front page is the best jockey in the world, the third best horse in the world, so much diversity, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. I can't wait. Will we see it in the future if British racing continues to go down the same path? It's a good question. And to an extent, it was touched on by um, Chris Waller when, when I interviewed him uh, at Ascot on Friday. And thank you for the kind words. Um, <laughs> With, with Nature Strip, because on the, on the one hand, he made the point that it's not necessarily an easy sell if you're a trainer speaking to owners over there about bringing your horse to Royal Ascot. Obviously, it's a marathon journey. Um, it takes a big chunk of time out of that horse's year. It's not just a case of you yeah. come across for a week. It's the time in preparing the horse, the time, the recovery time. He made the point that for a horse like Nature Strip, 
there would be three or four races in a calendar year that would be at least as valuable as the, the Platinum Jubilee. Hey, look at the, the, the money that's on offer in the, the Everest, which will be his target when he goes back to Australia in October. And that's 15 million Aussie dollars or something, something like that. Just an outrageous sum of money. So it is a, a big ask and it's a big financial gamble as well. But against that, the enthusiasm that they are expressing for this challenge, the almost reverence with which Chris Waller was talking about Royal Ascot, this feeling that they, they've landed on, on the home of racing, the greatest race meeting in the world, and they were honoured to be taking part in it. And if you look at the two horses he's bringing, on the one hand, you've got Home Affairs, who's owned by Coolmore, the, um, the, the, the biggest sort of commercial superpower in, in global flat racing. They see the attraction of Royal Ascot for an Aussie horse because of what it can do to his potential stud value. Nature Strip is a gelding with no residual value. Well, he has got residual value because they could sort of now make a fortune, but he's not got the same residual value as Home Affairs. He's also syndicate owned. And Chris was making the point again, and this applies to Arturo as well, the other Aussie horse in the Platinum Jubilee, that um, they're, just, they're just thrilled to be on the ride. That this gives them the trip of a lifetime with a horse that good. So I'm sort of contradicted in my mind. In, uh, for, for, well, I'm not contradicted in thinking this is a great thing. Wonderful to have the internationals at Royal Ascot. And Nick Smith within Ascot has done an incredible job in recent years. Actually, over a long time now, in bring, yeah. making that meeting more valuable. That's a, lot, a lot of it is down to him. He's done a wonderful job. But on the one hand, we celebrate the fact that there is such reverence for Alaska and that they're coming from Japan, from America, from Australia. But equally, there's that built-in concern that links back to field sizes, as you say, Maddie, that unless British field size, British prize money can improve, this is not so much maybe about Royal Ascot, but about other meetings, will, we, will they keep coming over? And I think one thing about Royal Ascot as well, and Chris said it in his piece with you, is he has an awful lot of respect and he enjoys the history of British racing. Now, you, you know, racing's heritage, um, Royal Ascot is in the blood um, of British racing, but I feared that further down the line, Chris, that a lot of trainers, owners aren't necessarily going to have that same enthusiasm and respect for it because the money's not there. How long can we afford to live but, off the heritage in this way? Yes, I know. It, uh, so heritage is such a strange alchemy, isn't it? You know, you sort of, there's nothing you can do to, to produce heritage if you don't happen to have it. If you do have it, well, you know, lucky you. It, it's never really been about the money. I don't suppose any of these raiders, even 15, 20 years ago, were ever coming across because no. there were pots of gold to be aimed at. A lot of money in, on offer, in fairness to Royal Ascot this week. I mean, I, uh, did I see a figure 35 million? Yeah, they've quid? done a great job. It's, yeah. it's up about 18% on 2019 levels, which considering everything we've been through in the last three years, that's amazing by itself and, and they deserve credit for that. It still wouldn't compare with the sort of pots that these top Aussie horses or US horses would be able to compete for on their home soil. Um, so we've got to be grateful that we've got this fantastic show that, that draws them. And I think part of that is that it's it's like another peak to scale. If you've got a horse that's done everything at home, you know, he's won all the, the big races for his division. Um, well, you've still got something else to aim at. You know, can you go over to Ascot and win there? Um, and what encourages um, people from Australia and the US is that it's been done but it's not easy, you know? And so you, maybe you could, your horse could be in that bracket, the sort of same as Black Caviar, um, although bearing in mind, you know, she only just won in the end. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, there's that special, like a USP, isn't it? You know, that you, you get to maybe meet the Queen, maybe other members of the Royal Family, um, which, you know, you, you can't get elsewhere. I think as long as we keep showing these people a really good time, as, the, as long as they come over and have a great experience, win or lose, and they go back to their countries and tell everyone it was brilliant, um, then, you know, we can hope for many more years like this. Um, you, you do have, uh, that's what makes me sort of wonder slightly about the Royal Family support for the race meeting in the future. You know, it would be nice to have some idea of what that was going to look like, because I still think that's going to be key for some, people from other jurisdictions. So that's, that's a major part of the appeal of the week. Um, so that's something that we have to take care of. Um, but at the moment, you know, it seems that it's, it's like a self-fulfilling thing, isn't it? We were attracting good numbers of, of overseas raiders. Um, and that seems to lead to other people from those countries to think, well, you know, maybe this is something that I should be trying to do too. Maybe that will be the point when I've arrived in my training career, when I can send a horse over to Berkshire and, and, and compete.
I guess at the same time, we're talking, you know, it's an easy one this for me this week to say, you know, because it is such a brilliant week. The prize money's there, the heritage, everything we've spoken about is brilliant. But it also relates to the, the lower levels. And I wonder how many of the, the big handicap winners, for instance, are going to remain in Britain long term from this week, um, Lee. And of course, you're going to get big fields when, when there's the prize money there. Um, and we're not necessarily seeing the same level of international competition at other flagship meetings, which personally I'd love to see. I know not everyone shares that view. Um, what do you think racing can do to, to strengthen its position internationally? Um, I think realistically, aside from that, that heritage, the, the, the only card that you can play as a jurisdiction is money. That can sometimes mean subsidising trips for international horses, but realistically, it is in prize money. You look at, for example, the Japan Cup this year, that's a massive financial uh, boost to that race. Just last week, the VRC, the Victoria Racing Club, announced that the Saturday of the Melbourne Cup Carnival had had, a, again, a huge prize money injection, and that will now have three, three million Aussie dollars, so 1.5 million sterling group ones on the final day. They, they will be a, a, a draw for international horses. Um, I think you know all, all we can do is keep pushing the case that whilst money needs to be in British racing at, at all levels, people become interested in horse racing because of what takes place at the top. Generally, you, be, you become a fan sure. of the sport because of watching racing at Royal Ascot as opposed to some of the, the lower division tracks. And we've got to keep making sure that those races are competitive commercially, financially, um, so that we get the sort of feels that we're going to get at Royal Ascot this week. Well, hopefully, Nature Strip will win the King Stand. Fingers crossed, Lee. Fingers crossed indeed, Maddie. And there will be 35 winners at Royal Ascot. There will also be a winner in this room any second. It is my job as, as uh, today's leader of this fine ship to determine which story is the overall front page story of the week. You might remember that last week I voted my own story as the, the winner. I can't do that two weeks in a row because people will start calling me names. Uh, Chris Cook, I've been complimenting him uh, before we came on air about his amazing shirt. So I think if I gave him the ah. prize, it would look like I was just doing it based on, on the shirt as well as his great story. I think that's so, valid. Thank you. <laughs> so on this occasion, Maddie, uh, I think a positive story as well. Uh, Royal Asset could be amazing this week, particularly say so thanks to those internationals. So Maddie, you win week two on the front page. There you go, it, it, it matters that much. That then was the front page for this week. Thanks so much for tuning in. We shall be back next week looking at all those hot racing stories. Until then, goodbye.